Our guest today is a Chicagoan. His family, together with Chicagoans, beat back prejudice and put a Catholic in the White House. Through the Special Olympics, founded right here in Chicago at Soldier Field, he and his family have helped the world to better understand our brothers and sisters with special needs. He is among the City Club of Chicago's best friends, Chris Kennedy. Chris, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm here at the City Club, not only to give you an update on Art Chicago, but more importantly, to thank you all for your help. Many of you have been contributors to the rebirth of Art Chicago. The whole city has been working together. For all of us at the Merchandise Mart, it has been an extraordinary experience. The Art Chicago story is a uniquely Chicago story. Its rebirth provides a textbook example of how a city that works together can rebuild one of its own economic engines and can protect its future. The story shows how a city can ensure that it remains cutting edge and relevant while always looking out for the interests of every strata of the economic spectrum. When we stepped in to help Art Chicago, I felt an obligation rooted in the unique sense of citizenship and civic pride which only a Chicagoan can feel. I know that all I know that all of you know what I mean because many of you taught me these lessons. We've had a chance to work together for two decades on a wide range of important civic, cultural, and charitable activities. I think as a transplant to Chicago, I have a unique perspective on the defining characteristics which make this city second to none. This perspective was gained through exposure to some of the most important institutions in this town. When I first came to Chicago, I worked at the Board of Trade and the Mercantile Exchange, and I gained a great working understanding of the life of a trader and the importance of the markets. I was working for Archer Daniels Midland, the great grain processor, and I began to volunteer at the Greater Chicago Food Depository. Through those activities, I began to meet the many wonderful people involved in the food service industry here in Chicago. For two years, I was chairman of the Chicago Convention and Tourism Bureau, and I met a range of entrepreneurs and small business owners who together created the state's most important industry. And of course, my work at the Merchandise Mart has brought me together with thousands of businesses from around the country who come to the Mart to work together to find success. <clears throat> Chicago is different from Boston. It's different than Washington, it's different from New York, it's different than any other place I have ever lived or worked. It is different because Chicago, at its heart and soul, is a meritocracy. It is a place where what you do is more important than who your grandparents were. It is a place where your creativity and drive is more important than the clubs you join. It is a place where success comes from hard work and not from inherited stature. It is a place where your social status is defined not by what you have taken from the city, but what you have given back to the community. It is a place where a cop's son can become the most important authority on the city council, or a Rush Street bouncer can end up running the mercantile exchange, or where the son of a Kenyan immigrant can grow up to become a United States senator. As a contemporary art show, Art Chicago has a tremendous capacity to reinforce this sense of meritocracy and can contribute to our entrepreneurial civic outlook. A city which embraces contemporary art embraces new ideas. A city which embraces new ideas embraces its future. Chicagoans embraced quantitative theories developed at the University of Chicago and our exchanges flourished. Chicago embraced new technology and Motorola bloomed. Chicago embraced new research, and Abbott Labs and Baxter became market leaders. Art Chicago represents a city which is always on the leading edge, always forward-looking, and always contemporary. Art Chicago has a long and important history. This legacy, was, as, as a proven art market, provides us the legitimacy which we build upon today. Art Chicago pioneered 
and then legitimized a new form of retailing in which consumers would buy art at a show. The show replaced the tradition and traditional and established system where most retail sales occurred in galleries and in auction houses. As the first of its kind, the show itself overcame tremendous obstacles in the art community. It gathered together a group of art dealers known for their individualism and fierce independence. Art Chicago persevered despite the challenging infrastructure at Navy Pier, including poor electrical supply, complex access, and what would become a fam famous leaky roof. The show itself was a home run. There was perhaps no more exciting party in Chicago than opening night on Navy Pier. It was at one time the most important art show in the world. At its peak, Art Chicago branded our city. It established our reputation in the contemporary art world. It helped support thriving galleries, and it contributed to our reputation as the best city in America to run shows and major events. The heyday of Art Chicago coincided with the construction of the Museum of Contemporary Art. The show peaked at the same time the Joffrey Ballet decided to relocate to Chicago. Art Chicago paralleled the emergence of strong gallery communities in River North and River West, and it helped foment the decision to renovate Navy Pier and McCormick Place. At the time when our city was best known for modern and contemporary art, the government boldly built Helmut Jahn State of Illinois building. At the same time, cutting edge, the cutting edge terminal at United Airlines at O'Hare and stunning buildings like 333 Wacker were all constructed and grace our skyline. The original fair was the vision of a fellow named John Wilson, whose Lakeside Group developed massive cultural events which helped transform our city. John Wilson attracted an eclectic mix of art enthusiasts and entrepreneurs to work with him, but his organization remained undercapitalized and vulnerable to the vagaries of the marketplace. This vulnerability was made abundantly clear when chaos rained down upon the show when it was moved from Navy Pier. The old art show was displaced from its traditional home so that Navy Pier could finally enjoy the long overdue renovation which was so necessary. That renovation, which has been a boon to this city, was a terrible blow to the, to the Chicago International Art Exposition. In many ways, the show would never be the same. These external challenges to the art show represented by its displacement from Navy Pier coincided and perhaps fomented internal challenges as well. The Lakeside Group suffered from the loss of John Wilson's two most important lieutenants, Tom Blackman and Mark Lyman. Tom Blackman left the Lakeside Group and formed Art Chicago. Wilson's relocation of his show to McCormick Place from Navy Pier gave Blackman access to move Art Chicago to the pier, a right he had earned in part by agreeing to stage his show for several years in a tent outside the pier's front door. The competitive landscape in Chicago quickly became further complicated. Several interlopers entered the market, including a group from Palm Beach and another from Cleveland, and each launched competitive shows on the same dates as Blackman's show. None of these shows had uniquely defined niches. Instead, they all competed for the same group of exhibitors. This was the world famous Art Wars period in Chicago's history. The show organizers refused to work together. They saw each other as competitive threats. Their costs were driven higher, their prices were driven lower, and eventually everyone withdrew from the marketplace. Wars, even art wars, are a disaster. Shows have tremendous cash flow challenges. Most of the costs of producing a trade show are incurred long before the event begins and long before the fees roll in. This can be disastrous for a small organization, and in many ways it was. Blackman's show lasted the longest, and he managed to continue to produce Art Chicago until 2006. He is, in many ways, a visionary. His depth of understanding of the art market is almost limitless, and his passion for the subject is nearly unrivaled. But as a sole proprietor without deep pockets and lacking a large infrastructure and without control of his own facilities, he too suffered from the vagaries of the marketplace. As Art Chicago declined, shows around the world would replace it as the dominant force in art. Versions of Art Chicago evolved, each dominant in their own city or country. The Freeze Art Fair in London was created. FIAC in Paris emerged. Maastricht in the Netherlands asserted itself. The Armory Show in New York City expanded. And most importantly, Art Basel in Switzerland emerged as a force to be reckoned with. 
The most interesting model for Chicago is the Art Basel model in Switzerland. The show was launched by a public-private partnership whose mission was to create a tourism event for the city of Basel. They saw the production of the art show as a tool for economic development. And as an economic engine, it was soon a home run. Eventually, the exhibitor base for Art Basel convinced the show organizers to open a regional version of the show in Miami to take advantage of the destination qualities of that city, as well as its role as a gateway to Latin American wealth. The Basel producers launched Art Basel Miami Beach in 2001 in an effort to create a revenue stream which would further support economic activity in Switzerland. The Mart and our team first became involved in Art Chicago last year. On Monday, April 24th, we received a call from Tom Blackman seeking our assistance with Art Chicago. On that Monday, the show was three days from its scheduled opening, and we understood the situation to be desperate with thousands of attendees and hundreds of exhibitors already descending on the city. We spent the night of Monday, April 24th, and all of Tuesday, April 25th, evaluating the full range of issues related to show logistics and operations. We studied options available at Butler Field, at Navy Pier, at the Mart, and elsewhere. At the end of the day on Tuesday, and I mean that literally at the very end of the day on that Tuesday, we realized that our only option to save the show was to produce it at the Mart. On the morning of Wednesday, April 26, one day before the show, Mark Falanga, who works with me at the Mart, and his team met with 100 or so gallerists who were exhibiting at Art Chicago, many of whom were from out of town, to describe our plan for producing Art Chicago at the Mart. The scene at the meeting was unbelievable. The assembled exhibitors were shocked by the sudden change of events. They needed time to absorb the magnitude of the change, and we just needed them to start moving their crates. Immediately our, trade show, <laughs> immediately, our trade show registration group fielded hundreds of calls from bewildered exhibitors needing assurance and action. Exhibitor services worked around the clock, making sure that all of the exhibitors got set up. Doc personnel worked 27 hours straight, moving in the show's exhibitors. They started receiving art at 4 o'clock on Wednesday afternoon for a show that would open 26 hours later. Some MMPI carpenters worked 35 straight hours setting up the show. Many painters worked 30 hours preparing the walls. Electricians worked through the night running cable and setting up lights. Accounting had to set up new accounts to track the new costs and to pay for it all. Our marketing communications group went to work and sent out 40,000 e-blasts to prospective art show visitors and placed dozens of print ads in major daily newspapers and plastered, plastered the Chicago area with radio ads. We tracked down 150 CTA buses and affixed new location stickers on their bus back billboards. We created 15,000 show directories for the attendees, which we designed, printed, and delivered eight hours after the initial request came in. Our PR group handled 135 media requests, arranged for dozens of management interviews, and generated more than 100 articles and broadcasts about the show. Meeting planning arranged additional catering, signage, and trolley transportation to help our 20,000 visitors find their way to Art Chicago at the Mart. Housekeeping and elevator crews ran 24-7 to handle demands of the show from Wednesday through the following Monday. Late Wednesday night, after the show floor was set, the Art Chicago gallerists started moving in and hanging their artwork. On Thursday, April 27th at 6 p.m., Art Chicago opened, and approximately 3,000 invited guests attended the opening night party, the Vernissage. On Friday, Art Chicago opened to the general public, and over the next three days, 21,000 people attended the show. During and after the show, we talked with hundreds of stakeholders and recognized that immediately that in order for Art Chicago to survive, it needed a massive rebranding, rebuilding, and reconstructive effort. We knew what we wanted to do. We wanted to create an, uh, create an art fair, which in its own way would be the best in the world. We wanted one which would reflect the international scope of our city and the best in class nature of everything that occurs at the Merchandise Mart. Our goal certainly was never to replicate what was once in Chicago or to become the regional version of a show elsewhere in the world. Instead, our goal was to create something which is reflective of Chicago's expansive art and cultural roots, thereby making it so attractive that it would warrant the attention of the international art community. 
We wanted the city of great architecture to be known as the city of great art. In order to create a great international art show, we needed two things. The best galleries from around the world who would bring their works of art, and the great collectors from around the world who would come to Chicago to buy the art. Coming out of the 2006 show, we had neither the great galleries nor the great collectors. We needed both, and a typical question at the time might have been, which would come first, the art or the collectors? In many ways, it was the classic chicken or egg dilemma. At the Merchandise Mart, we are market makers. We make markets all over North America, and we have faced this dilemma dozens of times before. We knew we didn't have the great art. We knew we didn't have the great collectors. We didn't have the chicken, and we didn't have the egg, but we did have a rooster, and that rooster's name <laughs> is Chicago. <laughs> We believed that Chicago could spawn a great art show. We knew that by working together with dozens of cultural partners, with the great arts institutions here and the civic bodies like the Chamber of Commerce and the Convention Bureau, that we could create enough of a spectacle that it would draw the attention of the world to our city. In one of our first meetings, we met with the head of a major cultural institution who I won't identify, and he had only recently moved to Chicago. It was summer, early in the show's redevelopment, and we had no dealers to speak of. We, we laid out our plans for Art Chicago's renaissance to him and described our plan to bring back the collectors. And he said, but you have no art. You have no dealers. The collectors will never come. And someone on our team said, yes, but we have Chicago. And every art collector in the world loves this town. There is no city as well suited to host a major international show as Chicago. It is home to two of the top museums for modern and contemporary art in the world, including the MCA and the modern wing of the Art Institute. It is three of the top five urban hotels in the United States, including the Four Seasons, the Ritz-Carlton, and the Peninsula, and more are on their way. It's home to O'Hare, the only airport in the country which is a hub to both American and United. It is a thriving art gallery community and some of the best galleries in the world, including, including Rona Hoffman and Richard Gray, thrive here. It is home to some of the most important collectors in the world and some of the greatest patrons of the arts. These modern day Medicis include the Pritzkers, the Crowns, the Harrises, the Manilows, the Guthmans, the Tullmans, and a host of others. It has a political and civic leadership which is nearly unrivaled in its ability to work together. We assembled a host committee who wanted to assist us in reviving the fair. This included cultural partners like James Kuno, Helen Goldenberg of Sotheby's, Bob Fitzpatrick, Antoinette Wright, Chuck Thoreau, Carlos Todolero, and collectors like Howard Tullman and Paul Zeller, Jack and Sandy Guthman, Stefan Edlis, and Susan and Lou Manilow. Our vision for Art Chicago was to create a citywide cultural celebration, starting with an umbrella event, which we call Artropolis. Artropolis is now comprised of a wide range of world-class art, entertainment, and cultural experiences. We thought then, and we now know, that we could lure back the collectors to our city to participate in a well-organized, comprehensive arts festival using the massive range of assets that already exist in our city. And once we were assured that the collectors would return, the galleries and their world-class art would return as well. With Artropolis, we've reached out to virtually every museum, art center, theater company, music venue, restaurant, and dance company in the city of Chicago. We have invited them all to be part of this tremendous event, and their support has been overwhelming. Many of them will be creating special programs and exhibits specifically for Artropolis. We have 45 museum partners, including the Art Institute, the DuSable Museum, the National Museum of Mexican Art, the Smart Museum, the Hyde Park Art Center, the Museum of Contemporary Art, and the Renaissance Society at the University of Chicago. We've created a special exhibit called New Insight, which is curated by Suzanne Gez, the Executive Director of the Renaissance Society. For New Insight, we've identified the top 12 graduate school arts programs in the country. Each of the institutions will submit works by four of their top graduate students for Suzanne and her team to judge. 
Half the applicants will be selected to bring their works to Chicago for a special of exhibit of what we think will be an amazing display of the future emerging talent of the contemporary art market. We've also created Symposium C6, which will be hosted at the Pritzker Pavilion at the world famous Millennium Park. The name Symposium C6 means to embody conversations, creativity, collaboration, culture, community, and of course, Chicago. It will bring together an international group of socially engaged artists, scientists, curators, technologists, and collectors. C6 will feature some of the world's <coughs> greatest art speakers, including Anna Devere Smith, Peter Sellers, Francesca Van Hopsburg, Father Leo O'Donovan, the President Emeritus of Georgetown University, will be speaking on art in a time of war. And thanks to the help of the Chicago Crime Commission, the world-renowned head of the FBI's Stolen Art Task Force will be sharing his story as well. We've partnered with more than 15 theaters throughout the city, including the Goodman, the Cadillac, the Steppenwolf, and the Red Moon Theaters. The East Bank Club, the world's greatest athletic facility, has graciously agreed to provide VIP access to our collectors from around the world. Stanley Tigerman and Helmut Jahn are providing a VIP boat tour of architecture along the Chicago River. The Frank Lloyd Wright Preservation Trust will be offering an evening tour of the Roby House. The Illinois Institute of Technology will provide a tour of their famous Mies van der Rohe buildings. We've partnered with a range of different music venues as well, including the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, and we're promoting the Hot House, Metro, Smart Bar, and others. Leslie Hinman will be hosting one of her spe spectacular art auctions, and Richard Wright, the great modern furniture auctioneer, will be hosting his own special event. CS Magazine is sponsoring Blanc, an international fashion show highlighting the world's top designers and featuring Chicago's most distinguished retailers, including Neiman Marcus, Saks Fifth Avenue, Max Mara, Escada, Salvador Ferragamo, Chanel, Mark Heister, and Nordstrom. In addition, we've identified 40 to 50 restaurants throughout the city, including Charlie Trotter's, MK, and Tizzy Malou, each of which have terrific food, artistic interiors, and great art, which will appeal to this community. Over 20 prominent Chicagoans, including the Manilows, the Guthmans, and the Tullmans, and the Grays, will open their homes or private collections to a small group of fellow collectors. While we focused on the wealthy and powerful collectors, we don't think Art Chicago, or art in general, should be the exclusive province of the rich and powerful, or the educated and elite. We have a much more democratic view of Art Chicago's impact on our city. We believe it should touch the lives of hundreds of thousands and not just thousands. We think it is a unique teaching tool and so we've developed a massive student day program which will be made available to colleges, high schools, and grade schools throughout the Chicago area. After creating the vision, we went to the city and we won Mayor Daly's endorsement for the concept. By creating our Tropolis, we had an event which would, was clearly capable of attracting back to the city the great collectors and art buyers. As market makers, we knew that the rooster was working, its call was waking up the world, and we could go after the art dealers. We first went to the Art Dealers Association of Chicago and gained their unanimous support. We then reached out to other galleries from around the world. We went to Art Basel in Switzerland, Fries, Scope, and Zoo in London, Art Cologne in Germany, FIAC in Paris, Art Forum in Berlin, Art Toronto in Canada, Art 212, APAD, Art 20, IFPDA, Scope, Pulse, and the ADAA's Art Show in New York City, and Art Basel in Miami Beach. It's my pleasure to stand before you now and say that by working together, Chicago will once again have a world-class art fair. We have not simply survived, we are beyond back. We have laid the, fat, the foundation for a massive economic event. Over 400 independent exhibitors will participate in our Tropolis. This is four times more than the number which participated in last year's art show. Because of their confidence, each exhibitor will use much more space and the shows will occupy more than 400,000 square feet, much larger in scope and scale than the 60,000 feet used to host last year's show. We have galleries from Boston and Philadelphia, from Milwaukee, from New York, from San Francisco and Los Angeles. We have great dealers from Munich, Bogota, London, and Seoul. We have dealers coming from Verona, Montreal, Toronto, Madrid, 
Paris, and Stockholm. In addition to Art Chicago, Artropolis will feature four other concurrent shows, all of which will be produced in the Merchandise Mart complex. The Artist Project is a juried show featuring cutting ed edge artists as yet undiscovered by the community of gallerists. For this show, our selection committee called through 170 applications and selected an elite cadre of 50 artists who will be, ex be exhibiting at this unique show. The Intuit show features non-traditional folk artists and outsider artists who create ethnographic and visionary art, which are two of the hottest new categories, and it will be the largest outsider art show ever held in Chicago. The Bridge Art Fair, produced by Michael Workman, features emerging dealers who represent emerging artists. In previous years, this show was produced in a small hotel that was miles from downtown Chicago. By integrating the show into the Merchandise Mart and co-marketing it, it will be the biggest Bridge Art Fair ever produced. The Merchandise Mart International Antiques Fair is now in its 10th year, and it will attract 125 of the world's top antique dealers. Never before have all of these galleries shown together in the same complex. This is a massive exhibit capable of drawing attendance from around the world. With 400 exhibitors, each bringing an average of 20 pieces of work, there will be more than 8,000 works of art on display. The works of art which sell at these shows are extraordinary. The quality and scope of the art would be a welcome addition to any museum collection in the world. There will be classic modern painters like Picasso and Brock and Dubuffet, works by Rauschenberg and Clay and Klein, great proven contemporary artists like David Hockney and Jim Dine, works by pop artists like Andy Warhol, Keith Haring and Brito, and cutting edge work and new media by artists like Eve Sussman, Simone Karen, and Christo. There will be works by artists no longer living and artists who are still creating. There will be painting and sculptures and antiques and photography. This stuff matters. This massive show model has changed the distribution of art, pulling more buying volume out of the auction houses and out of the galleries so that 50 to 60% of volume is now done through these shows. The works of art which sell on the show floor often cost more than a great car. They cost more than a condominium on East Lakeshore Drive. Some cost more than the cost of an entire office building in the loop. <laughs> Contemporary art can be challenging, but that's why the show matters. We can't simply say that contemporary art is a New York thing, or a Miami thing, or an LA thing. It's got to be a Chicago thing. We can't give up. It's too important. There is too much at stake. Art shows are big business for the cities that host them. Last week, there was a show, last week, very, six days ago, there was a show in Madrid, and it attracted 190,000 attendees. It's bigger than almost every show of any kind held anywhere in the United States. We need to make sure Chicago is home for that market. Every time we attract a tourist to the town or attract an attendee to our shows, we make a contribution to strengthen the social fabric of our city. The shows that are run in Chicago help every strata of the economic spectrum, from the wealthiest owners of hotels and resorts to entry-level workers just starting off, the economic boost that the shows produce helps them all. We want to create with Art Chicago another economic engine which will benefit everyone in the city. Our shows with their millions of dollars of economic impact contribute to a vibrant, robust, and diversified economic base there is no single solution to the problems facing great American cities, but if there were, that single solution would look an awful lot like a healthy convention and trade show industry. Art Chicago's rebirth is good for our economy, but it's also good for our community. A successful contemporary art fair like Art Chicago can go a long way to creating an event which provides a diverse cross-section of the population an opportunity to expose themselves to contemporary art. Involvement in the arts can be a transforming experience for old and young alike. Dr. Henry Betts, the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, will tell you that art plays an important role in lifting the spirits of his patients. The Very Special Arts Organization in Washington, D.C. will provide testament to the rehabilitative benefits of the arts for everyone from the military veterans to grade schoolers. For some, the arts open up new vistas and a vision for their future. For others, it helps pull them back from the abyss. Artropolis can initiate new devotees of the subject as well as refine the interests of experienced collectors. 
In both cases, the outcome is good for the city. Contemporary art encourages acceptance of new ideas and, the, and indeed new approaches to traditional challenges. I don't think it was merely accidental or coincidental that the great architects of the International School of Architecture like Mies van der Rohe and Louis Kahn were transforming the city of Chicago's architecture while simultaneously the city transformed itself during the same period from a backward looking fearful outlook to a city which fully embraced its future. A little over a generation ago, the Midwest was the center of this country's isolationist movement. It was then the very heart of Fortress America. But a great conversion has occurred within decades. Today, we jam port cities from Rotterdam to Osaka with the products of our heartland. We dominate world markets from London to Tokyo with the products of our exchanges. And our companies like Exelon, Baxter Labs, and Motorola lead the world in fuel, healthcare, and technology. I'm convinced that a city that is willing to embrace contemporary art and architecture is more likely to embrace change and new concepts in the future than is one that is mired in the stilted traditions of the past. Art Chicago has the potential to be a transforming event for the city, ensuring that we'll continue to embrace new ideas, welcome fresh concepts, and fear no change. Art Chicago is as much about Chicago as it is about art. We want to contribute to Chicago's success. We want to showcase great contemporary art and draw collectors from around the country. Most importantly, a city which embraces contemporary art will foster a whole new self-sustaining industry of entrepreneurs who feed off new ideas and innovative products. New products fuel new jobs, and new jobs fuel everything else from an expanding tax base to new homes to urban renaissance. But it all starts with new products, ideas, and they demand an openness to great contemporary thinking. A city which embraces contemporary art embraces new ideas. A city which embraces new ideas embraces its future. Artropolis and its star, Art Chicago, the products of so many people working together, offers one more important opportunity to showcase Chicago to the entire world and to say with one proud and prominent voice that we are truly and unequivocally one of the greatest cities in the world. Thank you all very much. some of the carpenters and, and the operation staff who work 37 straight hours. you to know I'm used to those standing ovations. That's right. <laughs> uh, step right up. Okay, well I think we were I think well, we did the trick. I'm surprised no one asked a question. Chris, Thank wait you a very minute, much. wait a minute, wait a minute. Art what are the, Chicago. What are the dates? They're the uh... <laughs> There's a card on your table. <laughs> It begins April 27th, Thursday night, so thank you very Hold much. Hold on, wait a minute. Art Chicago has nothing on the City Club of Chicago. A official Art Chicago right. City Club mug. <laughs> the history of the City Club of Chicago. <laughs> All right, Mike, only because, by the way, good thing you weren't Paul Revere. Why don't you get over there and... Uh... <laughs> Here is a one-year membership to the City Club. Oh, great. All right, Mike, go ahead. If I was Paul Revere, the British would own this country. Um, Chris, with, with, with the concentration and the importance of art that you just delineated unbelievably well, there's been a lot of discussion the last 10 years over the issue of government funding of the arts. And what's the appropriate role uh, for government funding of the arts? What do you think is the appropriate role? How should it be determined to what extent government, and especially the federal government, should be funding the arts? Well, I think our... our um 
Our point of view on that is this, that we saw as a private enterprise that there was a role for us to step in and, and support the arts in a way that the government could not possibly do. But I, I'd say this, that the, the government in this city and in the state of Illinois has spent billions of dollars subsidizing the arts in a unique and subtle way. That is the creation of Navy Pier, the rebirth of Navy Pier and, and McCormick Place gave this town great uh, venues in which to host terrific art events. And perhaps in the future we'll be able to use those, but we shouldn't lose track of the role that government has played in supporting the arts through all of those years. Uh, you had one picture, and you spoke for one moment about children and, and arts. Uh, one of the many hats I wear, I help support a school on the south side. My kids couldn't afford $15 per person admission. What are you doing so children will be able to come? Is there any kind of funding? Oh, yeah, sure. The, on Monday of the show, there's an enormous um, program developed specifically for students of you know all, all different varieties. The fact is that the 400 gallery owners who are coming into Chicago. There's usually two or three of those folks um, per gallery, so there might be 1,200 people. Those 1,200 people are probably the best experts on art in the United States or from all over the world. And all of them can be counted upon to go and speak to a classroom or to give a tour of the act as a docent, to reach out to those students and help them connect in a way that they would never connect before. So how do we find, find out about funding for students to be able you to You know, in, in, in about two weeks, there'll be a big brochure that hits your desk and a whole bunch of other people's. And well, I have it, no desk to hit. I'm a volunteer. So I don't have a desk at a school. But you're saying it's going to it, schools? It, so and I it'll go to schools, and there'll be a way for them to contact our team. Uh, David Drury is over at that table, and you can go over there, and we'll set up a tour right away. Thank you. Sure. Hi, I'm Ellie Wilder. As a volunteer in the arts currently, um, I know you'll need a large cadre of people to make this a success, and I'd like to know how we in the community can volunteer to help you. Well, there, there's, there's hundreds of different ways. I would say that for, for the shows that we're running, um, there are ways that you could you could participate in those. But what's more important is that the show that, that Artropolis has a lasting impact on the institutions that are here in Chicago. They should, it should act as the blockbuster event which for the first time that year gets people involved in a new experience. And what would be best is if you could figure out how the organizations that you currently have a relationship with can benefit from Artropolis. Figure out how they can benefit from the enormous publicity, the tremendous direct mail, the great advertising program, the fact that 30, 40,000 people will be in Chicago. And let's get them over to the MCA. Let's get them down to the Hyde Park Arts Center. Let's expose all of those institutions that are so great for Chicago to these people who might write a check, who might provide an underwriting, who might fall in love with a small, uh, small organization. And that's right, what I would do. Okay, you. sure. Okay, thank you all. Thank you for all of uh, before we adjourn, there are a lot of political heavy hitters here. Uh, you don't have to be a genius to say perhaps my buddy who I've known for 40 years could possibly have a political career. <laughs> Is it possible? <laughs> We're adjourned. <laughs>